thank you, first of all, Mary. Uh, I would have been happy if you said nothing about me. It was nice to have Barbara Gallup, but uh, it, was, it was a great introduction. And it, um, uh, it really is a great privilege to be here. This is really weird because now they're like a picture of me. <laughs> <laughs> It's your um, picture. No, I don't want to get that. Although it's better than what I look like right now. Um, <laughs> but it's a great privilege to be here with all of you to remember Barb McDowell and to honor all the foundations we're carrying forward, her great legacy of law and the life. Winston Churchill never had the privilege of meeting Barb McDowell. But he once said, what is the use of living? If it be not to strive for noble causes and to make this little world a better place for those who will live in it after we are gone. Barbara McDowell brought those words to life. As Jerry said, I first met her when we were both assistants in the office of the Solicitor General. Actually, I should say I first fell in awe of Barbara McDowell when we were both in that office. Um, I had mainly been a career government lawyer and had walked in this brilliant law firm partner from a major law firm who had a sterling resume and incomparable skills as an appellate litigator. She glowed with kindness and she was beautiful inside and out. It would have been easy for someone as uh, insecure as me to feel small when in the company of someone like Barb, uh, but no one could ever feel that way around Barb. She lifted up and embraced everyone with whom she worked, with whom she friends, uh, colleagues, clients, everyone who came within her orbit. You see, she was a legend, as we all know, everywhere she worked and lived. In her early college years, as Jerry was talking about, she managed George McGovern's presidential campaign in Fresno County, California. He won Fresno County, California. <laughs> he didn't win much of anything. <laughs> Maybe he should have had Barb running the national campaign. Uh, while working as a journalist, she earned an appearance on the Merv Griffin Show. For millennials out there, uh, Merv <laughs> Griffin was a big deal, and maybe you would be interested to at least know that he created Jeopardy. Um, I will be done in time for anyone who wants to go see if this guy keeps winning on Jeopardy. <laughs> uh, she was a superstar in law school. Uh, her assistance with Professor Gratz's treatise on federal income taxation was so critical that rather than accord her the usual footnoted acknowledgement that happens for research assistance, Professor Gratz gave her a full paragraph of gratitude. He credited her, a law student, with making crucial contributions to virtually every page of the treatise. And he added, quote, she has been imaginative, dedicated, and thorough, and throughout the entire process has maintained remarkable good humor. Cat. It is impossible for me to imagine how this edition could have been completed without her. Do we all recognize Barb in those comments? As Judge Jose Cabranes explained in his remarks at the fifth anniversary celebration, Barb went on to become a favorite and indispensable law clerk for himself, for Judge Ralph Winter on the Second Circuit, and for Justice Byron Wright. She went on to join Joan Day, Jones Day, where she became a partner in the Issues and Appeals Group, and she very promptly became a superstar in the Solicitor General's office. She argued 18 cases before the Supreme Court, and as Jerry said, she cemented her legendary status by arguing two in one day. No one worked her cases any harder than Barb McDowell. She learned the law and records so thoroughly that it was not uncommon to hear her gently correcting the justices at oral arguments about the facts of cases and legal rulings to which they would respond, ah yes, you are right. Look it up, it's in the transcripts. <laughs> Barb, but Barb also always understood that the law is not a sterile intellectual profession. Uh, the real lives of real people are affected by every case. So before arguing Minnesota versus Milakton, a band of Chippewa Indians, Barb went to visit the band in Minnesota. And she joined them in smoking a peace pipe at dawn as tribal lawyers prayed for her success. And of course she won. <laughs> I should have done it myself sometimes. <laughs> uh, yet Barb remained unfailingly generous with her time when I and other colleagues in the Solicitor General's office needed help. And she was always spot on with her legal advice. Uh, her 
powerful brain that came alongside of gold and art. We didn't always talk about law after all. We did spend a number of years discussing when a certain boyfriend would finally propose <laughs> and what we might do to hasten that process. <laughs> <laughs> we were all rather protective of our precious bark, so we also insisted on lots of details and vetting of Jerry. <laughs> Threats if he didn't treat her well. He passed the test, obviously. Barb also graciously organized a baby shower for me, for my second child. Well, my daughter ungraciously showed up early. <laughs> Barb kindly rescheduled the shower and invited my little Elizabeth to come too. Um, and in the, the coolest of ironies, my brother was diagnosed with brain cancer while I was in the Solicitor General's office with Barb. She was a source of stalwart support, a sympathetic ear, and never ready shoulder to cry on through that time. She was Barb down to the salt of the earth. See, what made Barb so exceptional is that she combined that fierce intellect and unparalleled advocacy skills with an equally fierce care and concern for the people whose paths she crossed. You could have no greater friend than Barb McDowell, and you could have no greater advocate in your corner Barbara when Barb decided to leave the Solicitor General's office, she could have had just about any job she wanted at just about any salary she wanted. But her exceptionalism shone through again. She put flesh on the words of Woodrow Wilson who said, quote, you are not here to make a living. You are here in order to enable the world to live more amply, with greater vision, with a finer spirit of hope and achievement, you are here to enrich the world, and you impoverish yourself if you forget that error. Barb turned down the money and status to start the appellate advocacy program of the Legal Aid Society of Washington, D.C. She drove boldly into uncharted waters and took a great professional challenge and risk. Um, Barb, and that was all just because Barb and Dow was never one to talk the talk. She blocked the walk. She devoted her skills and talents to providing ordinary people extraordinary justice. In her too short career at legal aid, she won important victories on housing, protecting victims of domestic violence, preserving public benefits. She gave the poor and downtrodden of the district a legal warrior of the highest caliber. Barb knew what too many people forget meant that justice in our legal system is not an abstract ideal. She knew that justice will happen or not, and how lawyers apply their skills to each case each day. Barb knew that justice will happen or not, and how lawyers choose to share their talent with those in desperate need of representation and fair access to justice. Barb knew that justice happens when lawyers, as much as judges, make the judicial process work its very best, when they zealously represent every single client, when they stand up and fight for the outcast, the helpless, person who has no one else but the lawyer. There's nothing abstract about Barb's justice. She knew what it meant to take the time to look in a client's eyes and learn what it's like to be on the receiving end of the judicial system. She took responsibility for her client's fears, worry, concern, heartache, woundedness, and confusion on top of all the difficult legal issues. Justice is something that Barb and Pal made happen every day. She dedicated the last years of her life to delivering justice to those who could pay her only with words of gratitude and tears of thanks. The greatest testament to Barb McDowell is not that we gather events like this to remember her, all that is good to do. Our legal system needs more than remembrances. We need more Barb McDowells. So the greatest testament to Barb is what she herself would have most wanted that we pick up her sword and continue the fight for justice for those most in need. Through the continued work of the Barbara McDowell Foundation and the High Impact Pro Bono Litigation Project, as well as the continued work of the Legal Aid Appellate Advocacy Project, scores of lawyers have become Barbara's hands and feet in the battle for equal justice. The foundation has contributed to vital litigation efforts enforcing the rights of immigrants combating racial disparities in policing, protecting children in foster care, equalizing opportunities for students with disabilities, and expanding
Indian tenants' rights in Barb's name. So I'm happy to have this opportunity to thank the Foundation and Legal Aid for keeping Barb's spirit alive and thriving in our justice system. You have made it possible, if I can borrow President Lincoln's words, for a legion of lawyers to follow in Barb's footsteps and be the better angels of our justice system. In closing, I would like to read again the Bible reading that Jerry asked me to read at Barb's memorial service from Paul's letter to the Philippians. Tell me who you vision envision as I say these words. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. I mean no disrespect to the theological significance of those words when I say they define Barbara McDowell. So when the fight for justice gets hard, think about Barbara Dell.